Hello, pet owners, and welcome to our discussion today. July is National Pet Hydration Month, and I am excited to be here with Alex McKinnon, who is the owner and founder of Kin Inc. How are you, Alex? Fabulous, and thank you for having us here today, Tracy. Absolutely. I appreciate you being here. And I also have Karen Riley Brickett, who is the safety manager for It Takes a Village Pet Care. How are you, Karen? I'm well, thanks. How's everybody doing? Good. And we have little Brandy with us as well. Yes, this is my little volunteer, Brandy Brickett. <laughs> and we're going to be doing some demonstrations on Brandy later. Have you told her? <laughs> no, I'm letting it be a surprise. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and my name is Tracy Bisson. I'm the owner of It Takes a Village Pet Care, and we are broadcasting on our page today, as well as a number of other pages uh, on Facebook, to bring you some really important information on keeping your pets hydrated. And I know July is a very hot month, especially up here in New Hampshire, and uh, we've had some quite a few days above 90 degrees. And so there's a lot of really interesting facts that um, in my time getting to know Alex, and in the interesting research he's shown me, I've really had um, a chance to kind of dive deeply into this topic. And I'm, I'm a little bit passionate about it now because there's some really interesting information. And uh, we figured we'd all come to you and share this information with everybody. So before we get started, I do want my guests to introduce themselves. But I also want to give you a sense of what we're going to be talking about today. So the topics we're going to cover is uh, what are the common symptoms of dehydration Overhydration and water intoxication in cats and dogs. We're also going to talk about what is the proper amount of water your pet should consume daily, and the amount might surprise you. Uh, we're also going to cover tips to get your pet to drink more water and information on a new product that will help hydrate your pet and can add up to four years to your pet's life. And this is where Alex is going to share this revolutionary new product that he has created with us called Clean Bowl. So I'm, I'm really excited to share that with all of you. I am also a Clean Bowl user, and uh, you're going to learn more about that as well. So before we get started, Alex, do you want to tell us a little bit more about you and Kin Inc.? Certainly. Well, again, first of all, thank you for having us here today. My name is Alex McKinnon. I'm the, the founder of Kin and just in a few sentences, uh, just so you get to know Ken. So Ken's why, why we founded our company. We believe that healthier pets create stronger bonds. Uh, we also believe that pets are family, pets are kin. We named our company Ken with a second end to remind you to nurture the relationship with your pets. That describes who we are. Our um, tagline, Nurture by Design, describes how we do what we do. Our culture is all about design, and our values are innovation, sustainability, and trust. And we love dogs and cats, and uh, we've been in, in business. We're now in our ninth year, and uh, again, we love dogs and cats, and we love what we do, and we're very honored to be here today. Awesome. Well, thank you, uh, Alex. And I know your company is a member of the Pet Sustainability Coalition, as is It Takes a Village Pet Care. And uh, that's how you and I originally met. And you and I kind of subscribe to a certain uh, code of ethics, if you will, when it comes to uh, pet sustainability. So I appreciate everything that your company is doing. Thank you so much. And we also have Karen Riley Brickett here. As I mentioned, she's the safety manager of It Takes a Village Pet Care. She is also a certified pet tech for pet first aid and CPR instructor. So Karen, tell us a little bit about you and your expertise. Um, well, I didn't start in the pet industry. I started in the human industry and worked in um, as an emergency medical technician. I had that, um, I was registered emergency medical technician for about 30 years and only 10 of that was working on the ambulance. And then after that, I managed the um, dispatch, the 911 dispatch center in Newburyport. And then when I retired, um, I had used It Takes a Village Pet Care to take care of my babies. And then uh, Tracy grabbed me and said, hey, would you like it? I'd love to. <laughs> so I started working with dogs and cats. And now my, my main interest is um, actually emergency medical um, assistance for dogs and cats. And that's why I became certified as an instructor in pet first aid and CPR. 
Awesome. Well, thank you, Karen, for being here as well. And what are Brandy's credentials to be here today? She is a dog, so she knows all about dogs. <laughs> and she's and going like to drink water. Yes, she does. And um, she's going to help me show you a couple of the things that you can look for to tell if your dog is dehydrated or not. Perfect. All right. Well, I appreciate you both being here today. So why don't we jump right into it? So first off today, I want to talk about what are the common symptoms of dehydration in both dogs and cats? And Karen, can you share some of the things that people should look out for, be aware of? Yeah, um, some of the main um, things that you should look for is they'll have um, very dry mucous membranes. Um, one of the reasons, one of the things that you can look for and you can tell if they're dehydrated is when you look at your dog's gums, they should be a pink color, a light pink color. Some of them are what they call a um, candy pink color. And can I just do this for one second? <laughs> <laughs> what you can do is you can press on your dog's gum so it turns a little white and then see how quickly it becomes the pink again, which should only be one to two seconds. If it's over three seconds, then they're becoming dehydrated. And another way is you can check their skin turgor, which is how quickly the elasticity of their skin is helping it to bounce back. So if you pull your pet skin up like this between their shoulder blades and let go, it should go right back just like that. If it stays up, like in a little tent like this near the end, that's because they're dehydrated. They don't have enough um, water volume in their, in their system. If your dog is or your cat is really, really hairy there and it's hard to tell, then you can go up on their head where there's less um, in between the head and the skull and do it that way and it goes right back down again. So, so those, are, those are really important signs too, because that could potentially warrant a call to your veterinarian. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. If your dog is dehydrated, then um, to the point where you have those symptoms um, and they're panting a lot, um, then they could have an elevated heart rate. And this is something that you really need to have your vet check because they might, the quickest way to hydrate a pet is um, IV therapy or um subcutaneous injections of fluid. And um, that is something you really need to have done at the pet. Well, and Karen, tell us a little bit about the symptoms of dehydration for people to look for look for with their pet. As far um, as things like loss of appetite, reduced energy um, levels. There, yes, that's they have a reduced energy level, loss of appetite. Their eyes can look a little sunken. Um, because the pet's body is about 80% water. So when that water diminishes, even by um, 10 to 15%, then they're going to start having problems with organs. Um, the water is needed for all of their organs. The skin elasticity is another sign, lack of skin elasticity, another sign. Um, dry mouth, instead of their gums, when you feel them being all smooth, um, you know, not extra wet, but smooth. And mucous membranes are a little bit wet, that's great. But if they're dry and their saliva is like a sticky substance, that's another uh, major sign of dehydration and they need to be seen at the vet as soon as possible. Well, Alex, I'm interested in hearing from you in regards to, you know, the, you know, let's talk a little bit about the clean bowl that you created, but a little bit about the reason why it came to to being. Is there a history there that is an interesting story about why you decided to create a, a product such as this and, you know, why pet hydration became a passion of yours? Certainly. When, when, our, uh, when our team started our company um, in 2011, the first place we started is we met with uh, some veterinarians and we asked them what some of the biggest unmet needs are, are and which some of the biggest problems are. And we'll leave one of those topics for another day. But one of the things that came up is that dental disease is probably uh, one of the most uh, important diseases to avoid. 
because when you get dental disease, that can take up to four years off your dog or cat's life. Or conversely, if you if you if you're serious and take all the right steps, you can add up to four years to your life. And what what we learned, and part of my background, I worked for 12 years for the German company Braun, and we had an oral care business. And so I learned a little bit about human oral care. And there are a lot of um, there's a lot of crossover learning. And basically, the way oral plaque forms in a dog or cat's mouth or your mouth is when saliva mixes with food particles, and it forms oral plaque. And uh, oral plaque is bacteria. And uh, one of the things, if you think about it this way, it's, it's, it coats the inside of, the, of your mouth or your dog or cat's mouth. And then when dogs or cats are drinking out of an ordinary bowl, they're sticking their tongue down into the water continuously. That's how they bring it up. And, and oral plaque, which is bacteria, is following down in the bowl. And you could say, that doesn't matter. You know, dogs eat poop. You know, you know, I, you, you, you can make all sorts of arguments that dogs eat all this other bacteria and so do cats and it doesn't matter. And guess what? I'm not going to debate that. But there is tons of research to say that if you, if you don't re remove the oral plaque, it'll it'll harden into tartar and then it'll end up flowing through the bloodstreams to infect their brain, their heart, all their different organs. And so I, I'm probably getting off a little bit on a tangent, but we heard that oral plaque is the number one enemy of the longevity of our household pets. And um, we're not going to get, we're not veterinarians, so we're not going to try to replace veterinarians because they do a great job uh, helping dogs and cats to remove excess tartar in the mouth. And we're also not a toothpaste company. But one of the things we did learn through our research is if you think about it, every time the dog or cat drinks water, the uh, oral plaque falls into their bowl or when they're eating out of like a stainless or a ceramic or a plastic bowl and their tongue is going around, they're painting it with a, uh, a layer of all sorts of bacteria, including oral plaque. And I know most people don't know this, but actually, Commercial dishwashers do not get hot enough to remove all bacteria and all viruses from bowls. And um, one of those bacteria is oral plaque. And so we said, well, how can we help um, to diminish oral plaque? And again, we, are st we highly recommend that you take your dog or cat to the vet for their regular treatments. We recommend that you brush okay. their teeth as often as you okay. can. But, but uh, uh, the, the, this is a long-winded way of saying when you uh, dispose of all of the uh, oral plaque that's in a bowl and you also promote, uh, you do something so they drink more water, it will not only prevent them from re-ingesting more oral plaque, when they drink more water, it rinses the oral plaque off their teeth before it hardens into tar tartar, which can help them live up to four years longer. So maybe more information than you were expecting at this stage, but hopefully that's a little bit of insight as to what we've been working on. Yeah, and I appreciate that because obviously there's a lot of science that is behind the creation of your product. It's not that you just said one day, oh, let's just create something for, you know, cats and dogs to drink out of. Obviously there was a lot of thought and a lot of uh, details and like I said, science that went into creating this product, which we'll you know, talk about a little bit later in the show here as well as some of that great research that you mentioned about dishwashers not getting bowls clean. So I appreciate you bringing that up. So before we do that too, I do wanna talk a little bit about overhydration and water intoxication, just because it is, it is related to water consumption, it is very rare, but I wanted Karen to just describe what overhydration is and what the difference is to water intoxication, just because it's something that you need to be aware of when um, your pets are exposed to water this year. So Karen, do you wanna tell us a little bit about those two? Yeah, um, the overhydration and the um, water toxicity kind of go hand in hand uh, as far as a lot of people are concerned, but really, the um, overhydration is when cats and dogs um, are constantly drinking, um, but they, 
it's usually due to an underlying medical condition such as diabetes or Cushing's disease, which causes the pet to be um, extra thirsty. Um, they're usually also extra hungry when they um, when they have these two conditions. Um, and the water toxicity is usually dogs suffer from that way more than cats because it occurs when dogs are playing in water in a pool or a lake, um, especially if they're playing catch. So they're trying to, to get the object that they're going to catch and they ingest a ton of water while they're doing this. Um, it can also be caused when a dog tries to drink out of a hose, especially a pressurized hose or a pressurized sprinkler. You know how some of them will chase it or go to the sprinkler and go ah, 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 you know, down onto the water. Wait, can you say that again? I didn't get that part, Karen. What was that? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and um, that can... Um, cause the water to go more into their lungs, but it can also, even going into their stomach, if there's too much of it, it can cause um, a hyponatremia, which is a um, um, salt, basically, sodium in the blood, which is a very important um, thing to have. And it can cause that to not be um, as effective because it's pulling, um, it's putting too much fluid into the cells and the cells are starting to swell up. And if that happens in the brain cells, which it will eventually, if um, this isn't taken care of by the vet right away, um, the brain cells can swell and this can cause um, central nervous system issues. Um, it can also eventually cause um, seizures, coma and death. Um, so if you think that your pet has just swallowed a ton of water, they'll get a little, you know, they'll get bloating, you'll see it in their belly. Um, and you know what their activity has been, uh, you should get them to the vet immediately, because this is something that is, it's rare. But when it happens, it can be fatal. Um, so all of these things, you want to bring your pet to the vet when you're noticing that they're drinking um, differently than they usually have, either they're not drinking enough, or they're drinking too much. Diabetic animals as with humans um, are constantly thirsty, they're drinking constantly, they're constantly hungry, and they have to urinate a lot. So even pets that have been housebroken for years, if they start having accidents in the house, and you notice that the water is very much, is a lot lower than usual, um, that's a sign of an underlying medical condition. You should have them at your vet as soon as you can get an appointment. And like you mentioned, Karen, it is water intoxication is rare. That it's important for us to stress that. But I have heard stories of dogs going into a water coma and mm -hmm. the owners not really understanding what was going on because it's just so rare, you don't necessarily know what to look for. So right. it's good to just know both sides of the hydration equation, I guess. And the way that you can avoid having um, your dog become um, um, the water intoxication is if they've been playing in the water, have them come out and rest for a little while. Don't give them any other water. Um, give them breaks from playing and then let them go out again in another, you know, 20 or 30 minutes. Um, the same for if your pet has been exercising or playing outside, comes in and drinks down this whole water bowl, pick the water bowl up. Don't give him any more water for a little while. Let him take a break from that. Um, and then, put some more fresh water down and see how he does with that. If he drinks again, the water bowl dry, I think I would start um, thinking about getting him to the vet at that point. Um, because after the first bowl of water and then some rest, they shouldn't need that much water again. Well, I certainly don't want to leave our feline friends out too. I just want to give a couple uh, symptoms to look for with cats because cats can be very finicky with, with water and their food bowls and everything in general. So things you might look for, um, are the cat straining in its litter box, crying or howling, um, excessive licking around the genitals, blow the, the tail um, area, and also hiding. So, uh, you know, mm -hmm. we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, dogs and cats um, and their hydration needs later on. But um, to avoid, you know, urinary blockage potentially in cats, um, just some things to look for with, uh, with your feline friends. Yeah, so, and with overhydration in cats also – 
you'll see that they're shivering and they have um, very wet mucous membranes. Um, so it, especially from uh, nasal discharge, you'll see their nose is abnormally wet and you've got this stuff draining out of it. That's, those are a couple of symptoms with cats for um, overhydration. Uh, yeah, overhydration. Okay. Wonderful. Well, I think we've, you know, we've talked about what happens if your pet doesn't drink enough. And we've talked about what happens if your pet drinks too much. So what is the proper amount of hydration for a pet? And Alex, I know you had some, you, you had some very helpful information on your website about what was, what pets should be drinking. And the fact that um, I'll let you share the statistic, but I thought it was interesting. The percentage of water that pets are uh, made of versus humans. Do you want to share that information? Sure. And uh, I'll be happy to share what we've learned. And uh, I'll also would love to hear Karen's thoughts on it because obviously she's a professional in this area. The, the research that we've done, which and I think Karen touched on this before, is dogs and cats are typically about 80% water and humans are about 60% water. So if you think, you know, you as a human, if you are getting a headache, you're feeling tired or all sorts of health problems that you can notice as a human, just imagine how that would be amplified if you were 80% versus 60% water. So I'm just trying to underscore some of the great points that Karen made before. And one of the things that, because uh, we always, if we can find a reliable, simple way to educate people, that typically works best. So I think what we've been uh, taught from veterinarians and others is, I think a dog or cat needs about an ounce per an ounce of water per pound of body weight per day. So if your dog or cat, let's say, weighs 15 pounds, then they should be drinking 15 ounces of water per day. Uh, Karen, is that similar with what um, what 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 you've seen? Yes, yes, definitely. It's pretty much the same thing for humans. An ounce of water okay. per pound, you know, of um, of weight. So that's that's the thing that I found between um, being involved with human emergency medicine for all those years, and then getting into the human, I mean, into the animal emergency medicine the similarities are just, they're crazy. It's, you know, it's pretty much all the same thing. You know, there are a few differences here and there, and um, but overall, um, it's about the same, so. Yeah. Well, I think too, what, what we can help pet owners to understand is maybe some different and interesting ways they can mix it up for their pets in regards to trying them to get to drink water. So I know some of the things that come to mind is to always have a fresh supply, uh, you know, I know that dogs don't necessarily like bugs. I mean, it could be a protein source, you know, floating in their water. Um, they don't like it sitting around a couple of days, you know, gathering a little bit of algae on the inside rim. They like it fresh like we do. And, you know, what are your thoughts in regards to if they like it cold, if they like it room temperature? I know some dogs like ice in their water. Any thoughts on that, Karen, in regards to the science behind that? Um, well, the ice sometimes entices them to drink more because they're trying to get the ice out of there. Giving your pets ice cubes for treats is a great way to help them stay hydrated. Um, um, fruit and vegetables that are water dense, like watermelon. Um, and my dogs, she doesn't like watermelon, she's strange, but she does love um, yellow and orange peppers. And those are very water dense um, vegetables. Yep. Riley would eat a whole watermelon if you left it out there. He'd be inside of it. Um, but, yeah, um, frozen treats that you can add a little bit of um, low-sodium, low-fat chicken broth to or vegetable broth or bone broth and um, then put some treats in there also. Um, they would like that, and that would help to keep them hydrated also. Cats, I like to do the classic. That's really a good the, what? the Kong classic. Yes, the Kong Classic. And Kong is also a member of the Pet Sustainability Coalition. They make a good quality product. So, oh, thank you. yeah, yeah. Um, with cats, um, again, if you put some broth um, in their food or their treats, but they're a little more finicky than dogs, as we all know. And if you move your cat's bowl around, you might find the sweet spot farm that week or that day anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but, 
Um, yeah, try different bowls, try different um, areas of the house, uh, especially away from their litter box or away from any uh, heavy traffic areas where they can drink in um, peace and quiet. Well, I think that's such a good point, too. Like we have a senior cat and in the evening we normally gather downstairs, you know, around the TV. And so for mm -hmm. her to catch her water, she's got to go up the stairs. She's got to go in the kitchen. And, you know, she doesn't move around as quickly as she used to. So we actually have a water bowl down there, too. And I'll notice that at night she and our oldest dog will go to that water bowl. And it's, you know, they're more apt to drink because it's right there. It's convenient. It's easy. So I like the idea of having them in different rooms, maybe on different levels of your house. Um, yeah. If you're outside for a while or your dogs are in a fenced in area, you could have a bowl out there so that they can have access to that frequently. Those are all great yeah, that, that was what I found with cats. Um, the recommendation from vets was to have different water bowls throughout the house so that wherever they happen to be when they're thirsty, you know, they can just go and, and get a drink. They might not want to go into this other room. Like you said, if there's too much activity or because their family's not there and they want to stay here, having a water bowl there. That and fountain water bowls for cats is especially helpful. Um, they tend to like to drink moving water more than um, water that is just sitting there in the bowl. Well, I'm glad you bring that up too because too many of our clients leave their faucets dripping for their cats and we mm -hmm. all know how you know that can end up being a nightmare but also what i've noticed is the little ring of like hard water that it leaves the stain inside people's right. sinks so yeah I, I would certainly like the fountains better but you've got to keep them clean you've got to change the filter so you've got to keep up with that as well alex what works at your house with your pets well we're biased because we've been doing this for a while and uh uh what what we've learned from working with a lot of vets and a lot of people in pet care service businesses and reading and learning from science. And all the pet parents watching already know this, but dogs and cats' sense of smell are off the charts. And, mm -hmm. and what we learned is that um, very often what deters dogs and cats from drinking their water is because there is bacteria in the water bowl Again, it probably came out of their own mouth and people are saying, what if it came out of their own mouth? But the, the truth is, is when the bacteria comes out of the dog or cat's own mouth and it's sitting in the bowl, um, somewhere around 24 hours or so, it really starts to fester into some slime. Some people call it pink slime or what have you. And um, Basically, think of it this way. If you've noticed how sensitive your dog or cat's sense of smell is, they can smell that bacteria. And that's one of the reasons they don't drink enough water. And um, so keep it's I can't remember if it was Tracy or Karen or maybe both of you said it. We think that it is absolutely a top priority to keep multiple water bowls out 24-7, 365 for the dogs. Because they, 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 you need to have constant access to water. Uh, we use our own product. And the reason we use our own product is because it's germ free. And what we do with water is every 24 hours, we recycle our, uh, our sugarcane fiber bowls. When we lived in Southern California, we would also compost them. And basically, when you recycle or compost this water bowl, you are literally throwing away all of the 100% of the bacteria and or viruses that could be in there, including the ones that dishwashers don't get hot enough to kill. And since I've talked about this dishwasher thing twice, I, I think it would probably be helpful to understand the sources of this. So the, um, the National Center for Biotechnology Inform uh, Information together with the Canadian Veterinary Medical Association did research with pet bowls and they actually did it with raw food. And they, uh, they, they put raw food in a bowl and then they ran it through commercial dishwashers which get up to a maximum of about 180 something degrees. And they found that 67% of pet bowls still had salmonella in them after the dishwasher. And the reason for that, we believe, is if a commercial dishwasher only gets up to 180 something, 
The Center for Disease Control in Atlanta stipulates you need to get up to 250 to 275 degrees for several minutes to kill all the germs. So if the dishwasher is only getting up to 180 and you really need to get up to 250, that's the reason why 67% of the pet bowls still had salmonella in them. And then in a separate piece of research, because that's salmonella is bacteria and bad bacteria. And the, um, at the uh, Ohio State University at their, in their science department, they did uh, research in 2012 with industrial dishwashers. And they found, again, that there was a, quite a bit of viruses that were left behind by commercial dishwashers. You might say, well, why aren't we all dead then? Well, all of us have some form of immune system and we're not talking about pets you know, living and dying by the minute today. But the reason we bring this up is dogs and cats can smell this bacteria, just like the FDA will hire a dog to go sniff a huge tractor trailer truck full of lettuce coming in from Mexico. And those dogs can find the one head of lettuce in an entire truck because their sense of smell is so strong. So if you, if you think, well, it looks okay to me, I can't smell it. It's not about you, it's about the dog or cat, and you just need to understand they can smell the germs. So when you remove all the bacteria or viruses that they could be smelling, they're gonna drink more water. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Well, and I just wanted to show your, pro your uh, product here, um, Alex, because I really like how it is created. So I know on your website, you offer a number of different stainless steel frames, you know, based on the size of your pet that you can purchase. But then you've got these great bowls here that are made of sugar cane that are both compostable and recyclable. So obviously I love that because anytime there's waste involved, you know, can it benefit the earth somehow, you return it to the earth. And um, I, I even, it has like a very subtle, maybe mild sweet, you know, um, uh, smell to it. So I've got to imagine it's very appealing to pets, but you know, very easily fits right inside of your uh, stainless steel rim. And then when, um, you know, what, what does it have a lifetime of about 24 hours for these before you should replace it, Alex? Well, the, we recommend that you replace it when you're using it for water about every 24 hours, because that's when whatever bacteria fell in then will start to morph into the slime that they can smell. If you want to, you can fill them up with water and it, they will hold the water until it evaporates. And uh, so, some people use them for water, some people use it for food, some use it for treats, snacks. Uh, and, and I think one of the things you said, and that's how Tracy and I met, is uh, both of our organizations are very proud members of the Pet Sustainability Coalition. And um, one of the things that the Pet Sustainability Coalition did in 2017 is they did a life cycle analysis on our sugarcane fiber refills. And basically what you need to understand is sugarcane, fi when, when sugarcane is harvested and then they pull all the sugar out that people put in their coffee and tea, there is this fiber left over and that fiber is typically burned, which creates air pollution. But instead of burning it, what we do is we take the residual sugarcane fiber and we take it to our FDA compliant factories and they mold them into these bowls. They come in four different sizes. So, and then when the pet parent buys them or, or pet care service business, whomever's using it, when you buy it and then you recycle it uh, with the paper stream because it's already a, a byproduct of the sugarcane fiber um, uh, process, you are actually versus washing, you are reducing environmental waste by 122% versus washing by reducing greenhouse gases, electricity, water, and uh, serving as a replacement for virgin materials. And if you'd like to see our third party uh, life cycle analysis, you go to sustainablepetbowl.com and that's where the uh, where it's, where it's posted. And if you think about it, every time somebody pushes the button to turn on in the dishwasher, um, somewhere somebody's probably burning coal to create the electricity. That's where some of the greenhouse gases come from. 
Obviously, you're using a lot more water when you're washing. So those are some of the reasons why environmentally you can dramatically reduce uh, environmental waste when you recycle versus washing. And uh, the only other thing that um, that the Pet Sustainability Coalition thinks is important about what we do is all of our products are uh, assembled, packaged, and inspected by people with disabilities. And the reason we do that, um, sustainability, most people associate with the environment. And that's very important. But sustainability really has three pillars. It has the environment, it has the uh, it has society, and it has economic. So we've already talked about the environmental sustainability, that it reduces environmental waste versus washing. But we believe we're very blessed in many ways. I've got two ears, two eyes. I can talk. I get to play with dogs and I get to work with great people and the world's best industry. So we believe that we're very blessed. So we need to try to do something to help. And so um, all of our products, again, are assembled, packaged, and inspected by people with disabilities. And that also helps our products in, in some way, shape, or form help make society a little bit better by giving people jobs who otherwise wouldn't have them. And these people are just a joy to work with. And the third one, which is the economic side, well, for pet care service businesses, which is not really who's listening today, we save them lots of money because they can just recycle or compost our refills instead of paying their staff to wash bowls. And one of the biggest financial savings as a pet parent, if you do choose to use our product, um, is it can dramatically cut back on uh, dental disease cost. I don't know if you've checked into that. It can be hundreds, if not thousands of dollars. And again, to be clear, we recommend that you still take your dog or cat to the veterinarian for cleanings. It's important you brush your teeth. It's like as a human, I go to the dentist twice a year for cleanings. I'm also told to brush my teeth several times and to floss every day. So I'm doing three things. So we're recommending for pet parents that they do those uh, three things for their pets. And um, based on the research we've done, they'll save a lot of money on avoiding dental disease, and they'll also save money in terms of uh, uh, gr avoiding greenhouse gases and societal costs, and, and ultimately the value of your time. We know not everybody agrees with that, but we believe that your time is probably your most precious resource. So if you don't have to spend that time washing and you can actually get a better impact elsewhere, then that's something that's very appealing to our clients. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for sharing all of that, Alex. Obviously, a great company with a great mission and uh, a great product. So, uh, you know, that was one of the reasons why I was so interested in having you come on um, for, uh, you know, National Pet Hydration Month, because there's just so much value in what you've brought to this product and how you treat your people. And I think that, you know, when a pet parent makes a decision to purchase a product, it's more than just the product. There's so much more that goes into it. And that's what I love about the Pet Sustainability Coalition. It's the, the people that work at the company and it's the company's mission to giving back and how they treat their people. And that's just so important these days, I think, when you're deciding where to spend your dollars wisely. Um, so I would advise people whether you purchase, you know, from um, Alex at Kin or you're purchasing from another company like Kong, um, you know, take a look at the companies that are, are um, in the pet industry that are members of the Pet Sustainability Coalition. Um, there's a lot of great things that we're doing in that industry. So I, I'm glad you brought that up, Alex. And there's one thing that I wanted to say, because it, one of the reasons I love your product is because and Karen can attest to this, too, when we're. Um, visiting with pets um, in our clients' homes is there is sometimes when we will come across some really nasty bowls. Mm. And mm -hmm. it really surprises me sometimes that people will just let their, their pets' food bowls go, I, I mean, weeks at least, maybe sometimes months. I, I mean, it would turn your stomach what we've seen in some of these pets' bowls. And, yeah. you know, I get it. Time is money and people don't have a lot of time. And if they don't have kids to do the hard labor, you know, bowls, I get it. So that's why this product is so perfect for that. You're giving your pets, you know, the best health opportunity. You're not creating extra work for yourself. And then you can very easily return this product to the earth. Um, so I love that. Yeah. And 
as, Alex, like had said, as Alex had said with the bacteria, there's a direct correlation in not only humans, but in animals between the bacteria in their mouth and heart disease. So the, the less bacteria they've got in their mouth, the healthier the hearts will be too. Yep. So, I mean, just, just a no brainer, um, cleaning your pet bowls or using a product like this will extend the life of your pet. Um, mm -hmm. Because, you know, ask yourself as a pet owner, would you want to eat from a, a plate that hadn't been washed for weeks or drink from a cup? that hadn't been washed. And I'm pretty sure you're gonna say no. I mean, I've met with a lot of those people in restaurants that say, uh, I need a clean cup here, or there's something on my fork and you send it back. Well, it's the same way with your dog, but they don't have a choice because they can't ask you for a clean cup or a clean bowl or whatever. So, um, you know, yeah. give them a fighting chance. <laughs> well, well, by the way, if I may, um, Karen just made yet another great point. And Karen, I would love it if you correct me if I don't get it exactly right, but <laughs> One of the one of the key things that Karen said is another reason for ensuring with your dog or cat and yourself to getting all the oral plaque out of your mouth is when you don't get it out of your mouth and it does harden in the tartar and then it's absorbed through the bloodstream and basically um, it ends up in your brain in the dog or cat's brain and with humans. Um, there's a huge correlation. If you brush your teeth and floss your teeth and you remove the plaque, you're not gonna have um, you're not gonna have it build up in your heart. And it's the same things with dogs and cats. If you don't if you don't uh, take care, they'll end up with clogged arteries and all the health issues associated. So that doesn't the the clogged arteries doesn't problem doesn't necessarily start there. It actually starts in their mouth and then how that plaque flows through their bloodstream and ends up there. So it's in your best interest to uh, maximize your pet's overall health by taking care of their oral health first. Exactly. So it, and that plaque is also a big cause of infections, um, systemic infections as well as localized infection in the mouth. That's one of the reasons when, um, if you've, if you're um, going to a dentist for a certain procedure that has to do with removing plaque, not just your regular six months, some of them will require you to be on antibiotics for a certain period of time if you've got some kind of a heart condition because that plaque, as, as you said, Alex, repeatedly about the bacteria in it um, can cause some serious infections. Yeah, I appreciate you guys bringing that up. And I wanted to um, talk about a comment that um, one of our viewers uh, left. Her name is Patty, and she couldn't finish watching the video right now because she's at work. But she um, told me that her pug does not drink water. So she's, she's tried everything. And ever since she started making her food homemade about a, a year and a half ago, um, no commercial food or treats of any kind. She puts water into her food, but she never walks up to the bowl to drink. No plastic, ceramic only. She used to like ice until she realized there was no flavor. <laughs> Twice a day, we changed the bowls. Spring water, tap water, doesn't matter. Interesting. So, you know, and I don't know if Patty's still listening. She'll watch it later. But, Patty, I'd be curious if you'd be willing to take um, Alex's clean bowl challenge, which I actually want Alex to talk about. Um, because, interestingly, um, you can see find a page on his website, which I'll, I'll throw up his website here shortly. There is a page there with videos of pet owners who have uh, tried Alex's challenge and have given their pets a choice. So they'll either have food in their regular bowl and in um, a clean bowl or they'll have water in one or the other. And time after time, um, cats and dogs both are choosing uh, the clean bowl. And I wonder, Patty, if that's something that your pug might be interested in. Um, you know, Karen, I'm, I'm curious too, do you have any thoughts in regards, I know pugs with their smushed face and stuff, are there any particular maybe types of bowls? Maybe they need a sh more shallow bowl or something? What do you think? Actually, my first thought was if she's making um, her pet's food herself, it's much more hydrating than regular dog food, whether it's canned or not. Um, if she's giving him fresh foods, there's a lot more water in those foods. That might be why he's not thirsty because he's getting a lot of what he needs um, from the foods that she's giving him, which I applaud her for. Um, a lot of people are going to Whole Foods now mm -hmm. for dogs. Um, and part of the reason is because it's not only healthier and um, all the um, 
essential vitamins and minerals. If you're giving them a, a varied enough diet, it's great. But because it does keep them more hydrated than any commercial foods do. Yeah, that's but, a good point. I'm going to say, as far as a dog bowl, though, um, it, I don't think any particular dog bowl would be would be better than than none. Just don't make it so small that they have a hard time because they have to get more of their head down into into the bowl than um, you know somebody like Brandy who has a long enough no you know, <laughs> snout, yeah. <laughs> so um, that would be the only thing I could think of. Well, and Alex, um, is there any science behind or any recommendations behind your different sized products for different sizes and breeds of dogs? Uh, yes. Um, um, <laughs> the size that you have there, Tracy, is the 24 ounce. Okay. And originally, one of the reasons that we developed that size is it's a very low profile, shallow bowl. And the reason that um, one of the top uses for this is for cats. And the reason why is it avoids whisker stress because some cats will either not eat their food or they won't drink their water because if they try to put their face down in there, it, it touches their whiskers, which annoys them to no end. So we made that bowl a lot wider and shallower so that both cats and um, flat-faced dogs like pugs or boxers or what have you to give them, uh, and I don't know if uh, pugs get whisker stress, but cats certainly do. And um, so that that uh, that's why we created that size. And then we have, that's a 24 ounce. And then we have an eight ounce, which is the smallest, which is for food and for water for really small dogs and cats. Then we have a 16 ounce, which is for food and water for primarily dogs. And then we have a biggest one, 32 ounce, which is food and water primarily for larger pets, primarily dogs. And to Tracy's point on the clean bowl challenge, for those of you who remember seeing the Pepsi challenge on television, where you take a can of Coke, can of Pepsi, you cover, cover up the labels, and then you do a taste test. Uh, obviously, trust is one of the most precious things in, in our country, in the world these days. We assume that all of you trust your dog or your cat. And so that's kind of why we developed the Clean Bowl Challenge is... There are lots of companies out there with lots of different products. So what we did is we created the clean bowl challenge and you take a clean bowl, you put it on the ground, you put the frame on top of it. You take your ordinary bowl, whether it's stainless, ceramic, plastic or whatever, be sure and run it through the dishwasher because it's not going to kill all the germs. You can even use bleach. It won't kill all the germs. Put them both on the ground, fill it with the same water and then let your dog or cat into the room and let them choose. And uh, if you send us a video of your clean bowl challenge, number one, we will post it on Ken's Facebook and Instagram pages to make your dog or cat a media star. And we'll also send you 50 refills for free. And believe it or not, we've had tons of people do this and nobody's ever told us that um, it didn't work because we and doesn't mean that that hasn't happened um, but we also financially guarantee so if the pet parent of this pug wanted to try one of our bowls i would recommend the 24 ounce for the flat face and if she does the clean bowl challenge if she's not happy she can contact us and we will give her her money back assuming she is happy we will post it on facebook and instagram and we'll give her um 50 refills for treat for free and that's why we figure everybody's got to trust their dog or cat. So let them tell you what, how it really works. Well, Alex, you know? We go to your website. We take a look at the clean bowl challenge video that you have there. Does that sound yes. good? Yes. Before we do that too, I just wanted to capitalize on something that you said that I actually had never heard before, which was whisker stress in cats. Now that fascinates me because most people think that if they have a smaller pet, they give them a smaller bowl. You know, and you'll see these little tiny bowls for yeah. cats. I mean, I actually have tiny bowls for my cats too. Yeah. Um, I never thought of that. So that uh, that that's interesting. So I'm glad you brought that up. We learn every day because we work in the best industry in the world. Yes, we yeah. do. <laughs> we do.
All right, well, let me, I'm going to share my screen here and I want to show everybody the clean bowl challenge. All right, can you see my screen here? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. so I'm going to play this here. Can you guys see it and hear it okay? Uh, I think it, it, it went back. Oh, there, there we go. Okay. There we go. So, so basically, as I said, what people are doing for food and water is they're putting the clean bowl next to an ordinary bowl or a water fountain, and they're letting the dog or the cat choose. And you, you could say, oh, they rigged it. But when you keep seeing video after video after video after video, um, hopefully uh, you'll gain some trust that uh, this is all real and it's all based on the dog or cat sense of smell. Exactly. And one of the things that um, is important that I think Karen said it in, uh, water fountains are definitely an improvement over many water bowls because as she said, the, uh, the water is moving. Um, you also need to be careful if you buy a water fountain to make sure you examine what the filter is made out of because most of them are made out of active activated carbon, which helps reduce chlorine and the smell of chlorine. Unfortunately, it has zero impact on bacteria or viruses. So if you buy one with just that type of filter, you're just recirculating bacteria and viruses. So it's it, in the end, it's not gonna help as much. That makes sense. Okay, yeah. I love all these videos. I just love the pets making their own choice. It's great. And it's obvious, Alex, what you said about their sense of smell comes in play there because it's not like they have to check both bowls. They can already smell which bowl they want to get to before they're even right there with their faces in it. Yeah, that, that, that really blew our minds because to Karen's point, uh, I guess they can smell from way far away, but some, yeah. of the, some, some of them go up and they do smell both, but some of them get within four or five feet and they can already smell one has germs and the other doesn't. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think people just, pet owners just need to make sure they don't take for granted how strong uh, a sense of smell that our pets do have. Um, and, you know, they don't have choices. They can't express their decisions or their opinions. So you've got to, you know, know that hydration is important and, uh, you know, cleaning the pet bowls is important or having, you know, an option that um, will, you know, be 100% germ free. So, Alex. You know, how can people cyber stalk you? I want them to learn all about Kim. I want them to learn all about Clean Bowl. How can they find out more information? Uh, well, we have a website, which is keninc.com. So K-I-N-N-I-N-C.com. If, uh, if people do want to take the Clean Bowl Challenge, we, we do have a, a free shipping special this month. <clears throat> so if you decide to buy a clean bowl, you use the coupon code SHIP for free, S-H-I-P, the number four, and then free to get free shipping. Uh, we also have a, a Facebook page with about 13,000 fans. We're also on Instagram. And um, you again, you can go to the Clean Bowl Challenge page and you can uh, peruse our website. And if you have uh, additional questions, you can uh, email us at customer service at keninc.com, so K I N N I N C.com, or you can also call us at 980 272 6464. We're located on the East Coast in Charlotte, and uh, we love dogs and cats. So if you got any questions, give us a call. And um, we're, we're just honored and proud to be on your program today, Tracy. And it's been fun uh, interacting with you and Karen and Brandy, especially. <laughs> Did you hear that, Brandy? Well, now, what was the uh, the shipping free code? Was it ship for free, the number four? Yes, yes, ma'am. It's S H I P, the number four, and then F R E E. And again, if you have questions, um, customer service at kenny.com. Perfect. I just wanted to flash that up on the screen there in case people want to take advantage of that. Well, thank you very much, you guys. I really appreciate your time. Karen and Brandy, thank you so much for your in-depth information and helping to keep pets safe. And Alex, thank you so much for creating a wonderful product and 
for having a fantastic company and for also being a member of the Pet Sustainability Coalition. Thank you all. And I hope, to, uh, I hope to be doing more with you in the future, Alex, because I know you have another great product that has come out um, that is a topic in itself, as you alluded to at the beginning of this program. So we might want to share that with people a little bit later on. Sounds All right. wonderful. Perfect. Well, thank you everybody for watching. We appreciate your time. If you are listening to this on the replay, you know, drop us a comment below on the It Takes a Village Pet Care Facebook page, and we will be sure to get back to you with any questions that you might have. All right, everybody, have a great day. Thanks. Bye.